Hi, my name is Jose Fernandez, and I came here to rock. I want to rock! <laughs> if you're watching this, hopefully it's during DEF CON 31. If not, you're probably watching this on social media. So I uh, appreciate that either way. The name of my talk is, hey, my CPAP has a recall. Let's open it instead. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter as Jaded Cyber, and uh, I am the president of CompSec Direct. So with that, let's get to it. So for the agenda today, I'm going to talk a little bit by, about myself and my company. I'm going to talk about some of the services that we offer in our cyber range called Cleared 4. I'm going to talk about the Association of U.S. Cyber Forces, which is a veteran nonprofit that I support. We're going to break down uh, what are CPAPs, how they're used in like the healthcare system, what, what they're used for. Definitely going to talk about the existing CPAP recall with Philips. We're going to show kind of like a device teardown and explain the things that are currently there. And we're going to finalize this with uh, different like possible future research related to kind of like exploit research for devices like these. And then at the end, it's going to be questions. So uh, I'm a Puerto Rican hacker dude. I am a PhD washout, so you know that's that's kind of worked out pretty well for me. Um, I consider myself a, a mad scientist, uh, you know, mostly attack and defense stuff. So um, I worked a lot in like private sector. Then I became a veteran. I was a operator for many years on both the defensive and offensive side, and and now I continue to do that uh, commercially. I also serve as the director of recruitment for the Association of U.S. Cyber Forces, which I will talk about more on the following slide. And I've done a lot of like past research on like IoT devices. You might have seen some of the Zigbee research that I did a few years back, and uh, I have a feeling I'm, I'm probably going to reamp uh, some of that content now. Um, these are all of our social media links. I would certainly appreciate if you could, you know, follow or subscribe to some of these. Um, my personal like social media accounts are well they're they're kind of cringy so you know you, you get what you pay for but either way uh, i appreciate you taking the time to like watch this presentation and i hope you enjoy it so my company is called compsec direct and we offer full spectrum cno cnd services we specialize in iot uh, research and disassociated access we have a cyber range platform that's called Cleared4. And if you're watching this during DEF CON 31, uh, please, I implore you to sign up as an early adopter. It's $1 one time, and it'll get you access to our cyber range. We're probably going to stop taking early adopters at the end of this year, so, so this is it. The re registration link is there. And if you're interested about more, to finding out more about the services and products that we offer, please, uh, check out our website. So the Association of U.S. Cyber Forces is the one of the veteran nonprofit organizations that I uh, support. It is a 501c3, and its sole purpose is to help uh, shape cybersecurity legislation, create a possible non-military like cyber force, and we're not a social club, and we need help. So if you can, if you can volunteer, if you can, you can like join, um, the, the link is there. If you do become a member of AUSCF, you get a member benefit reciprocity with uh, AUSA. You get access to different like mentorship opportunities as both a mentee or a mentor. And anything else that you can bring to the table is certainly welcome. So I appreciate you like checking out AUSCF if you're interested in finding out more about what we do. So you might be asking yourself, like, what are these CPAP things, you know? So continuous positive airway pressure. So basically there are these like CPAP machines that uh, you put like a mask over your face and as you're sleeping, um, if it detects when you, when you stop breathing, it like pushes air in. Although there are different types of like respirator and, and different type of like related medical devices, this talk is only focused on CPAP devices. 
CPAPs uh, are used, CPAP devices are used to treat obstructive sleep apnea, which is uh, abbreviated as OSHA. And snoring is pretty common in people that have OSA. Now, central sleep apnea is basically when your central nervous system tells your body to stop breathing, which is very scary. So CPAP devices treat both OSA and CISA. Now, if you're into, like, the entomology of what is, like, an apnea or apneic event, so basically it comes down to uh, the suspension of breathing. Pretty scary. It is a breathing disorder characterized by brief, in brief interruptions of breathing during your sleep. Now, these pauses between breathing are called apneic events. Um, choking is kind of like a very common sensation for people that have apneic events. And when you have an apneic event, that prevents normal respiration. Think about like when you see somebody that's like crying uncontrollably when they go, <laughs> that's, a, that's a type of apneic event. But imagine that like when you're sleeping, when, you know, as you're, as you're sleeping and then you stop breathing. So it's like this choking sensation. And then for me personally, um, I, I'll wake up very energized and ready to go. And then I realize, oh, it's only been like two hours since I went to sleep. And it's because, you know, the adrenaline in your body uh, is, is responding to that lack of oxygen. It's like it's like that wake up moment. It's like do something. Uh, some people might like gasp for air or snore really loud. Um, so it, it really varies between people. So you might be asking yourself, you know, how, how many people potentially have uh, sleep apnea? So according to a publication from 2022, about 6 million people in the U.S. have a diagnosis and 30 million people in the U.S. are believed to have sleep apnea. Think about it. That's a substantial amount of you know people within the U.S. So like this person here, so Carlos Nunez, he's a... Uh, at least at the time, was the chief medical officer with one of these like companies called ResMed. And he's saying that, you know, potentially there's about a billion people in the world that could have some form of like obstructive like sleep apnea and they probably don't even know about it. So think about uh, from like a business like point of view, like the potential for market growth there. It's pretty significant. And think about like the health implications of if these devices actually do improve and, and treat, like, they improve, like, the quality of sleep and they treat OSHA and CISA, like, if, if we all got better sleep and we're better rested, like, uh, what impact would that have on society? So a lot of people use these. Like, uh, our current president, Joe Biden, uh, has stated that they've used CPAP devices. A lot of athletes professionals, I mean, you name it. It's basically anybody that has an OSHA diagnosis. So these, like, OSHA could be caused by, like, blockages, like, in your airway, in your mouth or your throat. It could be your tongue, your uvula, your tonsils, soft platelet in your mouth. Uh, normally, people that have OSHA are overweight or they're obese. So, uh, something to consider there, uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to treat the cause, you know, it's, oof, it's time to, you know, really take your, your health seriously and, and maybe consider, you know, changing your diet, exercising more. But apparently this is more prevalent in blacks, Hispanics, and Asians. I didn't know that until I had to do all the uh, research, uh, for this presentation. So sleep studies are done to measure apneic events. And you can have sleep studies done like in sleep centers. You can have some done at home. But when it comes down to it, some of these can be very expensive and you must be able to, to fall asleep for a, an extended period in order to have a you know, successful sleep study that could potentially lead to like an OSHA like diagnosis. So I've been talking about, you know, going on this CPAP rant for a while. So it was like, what do I care? And it's like, well, I'm starting to think that this could might start become coming like a privacy concern because let's face it, there's, there's been some accidents in the news and 
uh, for some reason, they're, they're, the, the people involved in these accidents are usually like in transportation. could be like somebody that drives a truck or a train operator, and they're, <laughs> they're getting diagnoses like either post-mortem or it comes to light. Like, oh, this, this trucker, you know, they had a CPAP machine. So, you know, obviously, you know, th I think they're being responsible about it. But then it's like also an impediment because uh, it's like, oh, because they had like sleep apnea that makes them unsafe. You know, there's some cases here that I've cited. And um, honestly, it's, it, it's pretty sad because it, I feel like it's just going to start being used against people. And like the marketplace for this thing for in terms of like economic growth is huge. So I've cited here like a report that basically says like the growth rate of this like in the next couple of years is going to be pretty significant. So there's a lot of money uh, into this whole like health ecosystem of treating uh, sleep apnea. Sleep apnea also causes mental deterioration. Can you imagine that? Um, smaller brain volumes. So that means like over time, like I guess your your brain starts starts shrinking. So that obviously has a very uh, pointed and measurable effect based on, you know, the research these individuals did uh, as part of their study. Uh, sometimes individuals, they'll get like a CPAP device and then they'll lose medical coverage. So uh, what I've noticed is like there are these like CPAP forums out there. It's like a really awesome like user community and they're they're helping each other it's like hey i'm having a problem with with my machine it does this now and they're like socializing like some of either like the manufacturer like uh um like button key presses to like change some of the settings or maybe like restore it to what it was uh, i also started seeing like uh firmware samples being shared around these forums. I was like, whoa. So like these firmware samples, at least the ones that I've seen so far, um, are encrypted so you can't just like bin walk these. But that's still like interesting because like people are uh, like updating sometimes the, the firmware on their CPAP machines to make it, uh, to make their device compatible with open source projects like I think it was originally called Sleepyhead, and now that it's, it's forked and it's become Oscar. So the open source CPAP analysis reporter. Uh, people are trying to interpret their own sleep information because basically they either don't want to go to the doctors or maybe they can't afford to. Uh, the other thing that I noticed was like in these forums, like people are saying that they were modifying firmware which is pretty interesting because uh, sometimes that's actually pretty hard. And what it, what I've come to realize is that people are using the term uh, most likely incorrectly. And what they're doing is they're modifying the configurations when it comes to maybe adjusting the amount of pressure that these machines exert, or maybe they're just modifying like other configurations, but they're not really like modifying the firmware. Uh, I'll show you like how we started down that process and to at least uh, I wanted to make that clarification because people are even like connecting like Raspberry Pis in some cases and using like the serial interfaces to like change pressure settings but that is not really a firmware modification that's a modification of the configuration so Oscar what an amazing like open source project I want to say a, a sleepy head was one of like the the first ones that was was out there but um i i wanted to highlight oscar because uh, they specifically uh, mentioned that phillips is basically putting encryption in some of this medical information related to like the sleep telemetry and they're able to like in some cases like overcome that and make the information available for people to use within you know this open source uh program uh, one of the interesting things that um, that can come out of the the sleep information or metrics that are coming out of these is it measures your AHI. So that people are very focused on their AHI, which is the apnea hypopsia index, which is kind of like a ratio of like when you're breathing and when you're not. And you know, again, not a doctor, so I might be grossly oversimplifying this, but um, I'm I'm going to show you here what Oscar looked like for me. 
in a little bit. So when you install this, uh, just look. So it's like unsigned binaries. So it's get requests over HTTP. As of July 25th, there was um, I, I looked at their like GitHub, and they've changed the default HTTP like download to HTTPS from now on. And look, it has all these like really amazing features. Like I was able to take my my little SD card, uh, you can barely see that, but it's there. My little SD card that was in my like dream station and, and it imported it. And I was able to see like all of my uh, like sleep information historical when I was using this machine. Uh, in my case, I stopped using it and see it's, it even tells me that my AHI average uh, is there. It's, it's giving me a lot of like usage information and it's specifically telling me when I stopped using it because I felt like I was starting to get like sick. Um, so I'm going to switch to a little video here and hopefully I don't mess this up. As I started using Oscar, I was really impressed with how easy it was to just import my CPAP information from the SD card I had in my DreamStation 1. I was presented with information that I would have otherwise not been able to, to have seen. As the manufacturers of said devices generally don't give out the software that you would uh, have to use to be able to see this type of uh, detailed medical information. In my case, Oscar's telling me that my AHI has an average of 7.77. When I look at some of the like daily things, I can see here 7.47. In this case, it seems um, my total sleep time here is a little bit over... I was laying down for maybe an hour and 18 minutes as I fell asleep, and I most likely slept here for approximately six hours and seven minutes before waking up and removing the machine. Uh, very detailed information that I guess somebody with a little bit more uh, patience and experience would be able to, um, like, analyze. Now, if I... If I move around days, here's one where I have uh, higher than the normal AHI, but it's only got like an hour's worth of data. And and here's where it's actually very interesting because uh, the way that I fall asleep is I hold my breath in order to lower my heart rate, and I basically kind of hypnotize myself into going to sleep, and I uh, almost always have to do something similar to this. As you hold your breath, the CPAP machine is trying to uh, ensure that you are breathing so it keeps pushing air through the mask and I think these high AHI readings are the result of me holding my breath in order for me to, to fall asleep. As I start and I'm back so um, these CPAP machines are, honestly, they require a lot of upkeep. Um, I used mine for you know considerable time, and it's basically um, you need to clean these things every day because if you don't, it gets pretty gross and you actually can become sick. Uh, think about it. So in my case... I would use like a full face mask. So it would basically, you know, cover this. There's some like uh, initially when I first had my 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 first kind of like issue, kind of like mask. It, it wasn't even a mask. It was just like these these things that I would like put in my nostrils, and I could, it it, w it wouldn't cover my mouth. So uh, think about having like a mask on your mouth like at night. And you use this thing, and and the way that these CPAP machines work is there's uh, like this little like reservoir tank where you have to put in distilled water, and and that uses like steam, right? And uh, so the the steam is just kind of there, but it's it's not really like super hot, but it's just there to to help kind of like moisturize. Uh, because there is a lot of like dryness associated to just using the machine without any water. So there 
uh, they're they're basically putting this like heating element into the CPAP machines to to help uh, keep it just more humid, so that way you don't have that like really severe like uh, dry sinus cavities, and, like nosebleeds and stuff like that. And so you basically have to clean these every day after you use them, because if not, the bacteria is just there, like on that mask. And you just keep breathing that, like, indefinitely until you clean it. Um, I don't really, I, I haven't really looked at people that have done kind of like those, like, like swabs and Petri dishes kind of things of, like, bacterial growth on these masks. But I can tell you, as somebody, like, who uses these, uh, you, you do feel it. It is noticeable. So you have to clean the masks every day. You have to clean kind of like the hoses at least once a week. And when you clean these, they basically just want you to use soap and water because those are kind of like the more like traditional, more available uh, ways to, to clean like uh, this type of medical equipment. There are some like other like cleaning kind of like either solutions or devices that have like UV light and stuff like that. And those actually like the manufacturers are telling people not to use those because they, because there's a lot of plastics involved in, in like a lot of these things. And it, it turns out that it looks like it, it breaks down or it reduces the integrity of maybe the seals around the masks. So uh, there is like this uh, total cost of ownership associated to just having a CPAP. And uh, frankly, it, it's not great. So it, it is a manual labor. You have to uh, get replacements. Um, there's a lot of upkeep. And then for me, I realized I just had the mental cost of ownership. I would worry about many things when I uh, was was more active, like using my CPAP machine. Uh, for instance, a lot of preemptive planning. I would I would think about why wh or what. What if this happens? If uh, so, I would travel often for work, and it would be like, what if the place that I'm traveling to, um, what if they're experiencing you know electrical problems? Uh, I'm Puerto Rican hacker dude, so the electrical situation in Puerto Rico has not really improved, um, especially after Hurricane Maria. So the power over there is very inconsistent, and it actually damages electrical equipment. So people in Puerto Rico right now are taking their damaged appliances and, you know, as a sign of protest throwing it in front of the uh, the people that basically run the power grid there nowadays or uh, in front of the governor's mansion <laughs> in Old San Juan. Uh, I would think about stuff like that. Um, medical equipment like this doesn't count as a carry-on device, but at the same time, you need distilled water. If you use normal tap water, you're basically going to inhale like any of those chemicals that are there, like those forever chemicals that are in the water that you might have heard about in the news or literally anything else that's in there. Um, and and it, it's very noticeable because like the next day when you look at, at the, like the reservoir tank where the like heating element uh, is connected to, um, you, you'll see the residue around the heating element. So it's like, you know, I, I'm going to grossly oversimplify this. It just looks kind of like this like white powder, almost like calcium residue, but it, it's basically whatever's in tap water. So that's why you have to use distilled water. Um, the, so you can't really just take distilled water with you, even though you can just like, Hey, you know, it's for my machine, you know, depending on what TSA agent you get, um, you know your mileage on this flight's definitely going to vary so i would i would worry about that a lot so then as i would like plan trips and stuff like that for a while i was taking you know those power strips surge protectors and stuff like that those are easy to carry but in my case if i knew i was going to go to like a place where 
either the electricity wasn't stable and stuff like that. I was literally just traveling around with like a portable lithium ion battery. It's like a big kind of like portable like power pack uh, just in case. So, so and that was just my experience and I'm pretty sure my experience wasn't, you know, unique to just myself. So I stopped using my machine according to uh, the information that I got from Oscar sometime in February of 2021. I uh, received a Dream Station 1 from the Department of Veteran Affairs. I, I had had sleep studies done while I was in service. I had sleep studies done uh, after I transitioned out of military service. And you know, I, I got a I got a NOSHA diagnosis for uh, like sleep apnea. I'd had uh, I always felt that I was just getting sicker using this thing, and I'm not saying that this is related or not to this this recall because Phillips basically identified a problem, and they did a voluntary recall. Now there's a lot of information. Uh, like like different media sources like if you literally just look up Philips Respironics like more often than not those first couple of search results that you're gonna get are gonna be related to like uh, like lawsuits pending class actions information about the recall itself and you know my device was on that list and to me uh, it was it was for me it was honestly like personally like really it was like a lot of anguish because uh some of the other medications that I had gotten from the VA uh they I would get notifications like oh w we understand that we, you have a prescription for this and it's like oh it, it gives people cancer then it's like oh great so now the thing that you know helps me you know stay healthy is killing me and, you know, the same thing with the CPAP machine. It's like, hey, you're going to be able to get better sleep and you're going to feel, you know, more rested and stuff like that. So it was, it was, it was, it was a lot for me emotionally because um, here I thought I'm being proactive about my health, doing something about it. And when this comes out, apparently there's this foam, which I thought was like one of the filter things. But uh, no, and this is actually pretty interesting because it's <laughs> it's it's this it's what they call a noise abatement foam. So they this thing is not a filter. However, it is basically in the airflow for for the device. Um so I think about like different like developer like let's say like programming like user stories or maybe if you're a software developer or maybe you're into like user experience kind of stuff, uh, just imagine as they're like making these machines and they're like, oh, you know, this machine would be great, but it's just too noisy. And they're like, well, what if we use like noise abatement foam is usually for like padding for like studios that's used like in like industrial like plants and stuff like that to reduce noise pollution. So this was my first introduction to this term because frankly um i i couldn't really understand how it wasn't a filter and it was like no because you know it helps reduce the amount of noise but at the same time it's it's in that like airflow and apparently some of the like materials that they use to to make this noise abatement foam um, as your CPAP machine heats and cools through no like normal use, the foam deteriorates and you can inhale this. And, you know, potentially, um, I imagine it probably gives you cancer. Um, as part of this presentation and the research that I did, um, uh, a spokesperson, kind of like, not really a spokesperson, but people that work for Philips. Uh, they shared like materials that are it's public materials related to, you know, why they did the recall, 
like third party like studies related to the likelihood of people you know potentially becoming sick by using uh the devices that have this noise abatement foam in my case uh I had one of them, but there were other models that were impacted in part of that recall. So if you have a CPAP machine and you haven't identified whether or not your machine is part of this recall, you should. Uh, because honestly, like even with all these studies and stuff like that, like why would they do a voluntary recall? And even if like 1% of the total amount of users, you know, can potentially get sick. Uh, isn't that more than enough? You know, I think it is. So uh, please take some time and ensure that you know you're you're using a safe medical device. What made this uh, recall more difficult, in my opinion, for Philips was the fact that I feel like the location of where this noise abatement foam that was probably designed to never be a serviceable area um, full disclosure I've never manufactured a medical device or a product that I've launched into market like a physical product but around the time that Philips announced the recall people on YouTube were sharing videos on how to like remove the foam. They're like, no, you don't need to send it in. <laughs> look, look at this person here. If you watch the video, it's like, wow. So they're drilling into the thing and then they're like scooping it out with, I don't know, something akin to maybe like a small tool, which is odd that I don't have mine here now. Um, but yeah, it's uh how bizarre is that? That made it more difficult because if it was just like one of these like little filter things that, you know, that they think, oh, you know what? Air flows through here. So logically, you know, we need to, you know, be able to replace these. Think about, you know, your car, your HVAC system, right? Anywhere that there's airflow, there's usually a filter. So I'm really surprised that, you know, despite you know all the research that they do uh, i i feel like this is one of those like user stories that that got tacked on where they're like oh you know we we have this problem with noise oh we'll just stick some noise abatement foam it's what i use in my studio it's great <laughs> i'm obviously you know i'm i'm you know taking the situation like lightly for but like how does stuff like this really happen you know so the that noise abatement foam you can't just like open it. There's no screws. There's no clips. I feel like they never designed these things to, to really be serviced. And that made their like recall that much more difficult. Now for me, uh, when I got it, I was honestly, um, I've been meaning to do this talk ever since I got my device. I'm not going to lie. The first week I got this device, I opened it up. Everything. And I looked at like all the embedded components that were there. I looked at, you know, things that looked like JTAG to me, things that looked like UART. I looked at like the components and I have not done this talk sooner because this is basically like unpaid, you know, research. Um, right? It, it takes time to, you know, do these talks, but this, uh, this whole thing with the like recall was pretty odd because people seem to want to gravitate to just home brewing and fixing things themselves and you know as the like attorneys that are related to like possible class actions against Philip are coming out of the woodworks are saying don't do that cuz then you're basically voiding voiding or you're voiding not only voiding the like warranty but you're also invalidating you know criminal evidence against the company because you've tampered and you know modified it so uh, in this case this other video like this person uses a dremel tool and does kind of like these like incisions to oh these things are kind of glued together too it doesn't have like these like snap-on things it makes it even worse <laughs> 
But uh, but yeah, so it's like all these tutorials for self repair became pretty popular um, as the like recall was like first announced, and I suspect people are still doing these because you know may- maybe they don't want to mail it in, maybe they're either unaware they don't want to or. You know, maybe maybe they got another device. Um, can't really say for sure. So, like I'd mentioned, I looked at the internals for these things, and uh, it's pretty cool. So, uh, in my case, for for this talk, I looked at two different like CPAP devices. I looked at a ResMed S9 that I got from one of my peers. Um, as you know, I got notified that. The talk was accepted. I asked, you know, hey, does anybody else have any like CPAP machines that they wouldn't mind, you know, sacrificing for the purpose of the greater good? Uh, One person uh, was able to like share their machine with me because like the other people that um, that approached me had the same uh, (laughs) Dream Station One, and I was like, you know what, I'm good. Um, As part of my research. I I looked online, and I was basically able to just buy one of these boards. I got mine used on eBay for like fifty bucks, and that's the one that I so I so this one was my original one. I have not dorked this one up yet, but I bought this other board, and, you know, and I compared you know the circuitry, um, the revisions, you know, in terms of like what was printed on the board. It was pretty similar for at least for like the Dream Station one. It was like minor differences. Um, like some of the pads were different, but uh, I'll, I'll be quite honest. Um, as a cybersecurity professional and uh, a business owner that has a lot of like cool like gizmos, this was very challenging because uh, you. If you think of all the, hey, like intro to like embedded device research or like maybe like IoT routers, um, that barrier to entry is pretty easy. Uh, I couldn't find like schematics or, you know, people that had done like similar research like this anywhere. That could just be a a me problem. But look, it uh, it had things that certainly looked like standard JTAG. It had maybe like really narrow pins. <laughs> it, there are some things that looked like ARM 20, ARM like 14 pin. I saw some 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 things that I could hit with J-Links. And uh, yeah, I actually was able to just dump the firmware for um the dream station I was working on just using like a three four dollar you know like mini programmer <laughs> even with all the expensive gig- gizmos and stuff that we had it basically came down to using a, a multimeter using a logic analyzer looking at what was on the board and dumping it out. So so far we can we can dump as of July 28th, which is when I've uh, recorded this uh this video. I can I can dump firmware, I can modify it, but when you try to like uh write it back in, be, there's there's still a CRC thing I need to change. But you know, it's like all things, they, they all they all crack. I put the kind of like the chip pin out here. It's it's pretty common. So in case you're curious about how to do it, it it was pretty easy. If I could do it, anybody can do it. So I looked at different uh, possible like future kind of like research things because uh, like in the past, I do like a one and done, but I definitely want to continue doing this type of research, um, especially uh, for the purpose of uh, like improving like our capability, like performing this type of uh, activity. Uh, for us, CompSec Direct is one of like Microsoft's 
like initial like firmware analysis, kind of like specialized like partners, and we want to continue like developing and maturing this capability. So uh, other things that we did was uh, so in, in the case of my Dream Station One, it has Bluetooth. So we looked at the like Bodcom module that it was using, and you know it has a very like unique OUI. So think about it. So if you can like potentially scan for these things, um, my concern is always like, well, bad people would want to use medical devices to kill people or to uh, like degrade their quality of life. And that's what I'm trying to prevent. So initially I thought it's like, oh, maybe like the Bluetooth thing, you know, is active all the time, but it's not. So it is on the device and you do have to like manually accept pairing and stuff like that. So, you know, there are some uh, mitigations there that help. I looked at the mobile app from Philips, like the Dream Mapper. Um, I had never installed a uh, consumer application that... Uh, that communicates with like a device like this, but basically it's kind of like an ad hoc communication. So it's not, it's not a constant thing. All it does is it reads the information off the machine and that's it. And you basically have to use, um, you have to accept it on both your phone and the device to pair it. And I was like, yeah, there are these SD cards, like the ones that I showed earlier, like apparently this is just like a FAT32 SD card, but there are people on the forums that are saying it's like, oh, if it's like, if you if the SD card goes bad, you can't just use any other one. And I I don't necessarily think that's true, but uh, it also has a cellular module. So so mine had a cellular module, and we looked at that and uh, like the like the chipset, and it had a had another flash thing. So you know, just just dumping all that you know yummy goodness out. So my plan is to basically continue doing a, a follow-on talk to this talk where it's like, hey, my CPAP has a re recall. Let's exploit it instead. You know, because uh, I think we have a shared responsibility to, you know, help make this device, medical device ecosystem better. And frankly, it, it's not going to happen if we just uh, just wait for the manufacturers to you know, consider security from the beginning. Um, I will say that um, uh, I, I think the vendors are doing a, a pretty good job. I didn't spend a whole lot of time like trying, trying all the things because again, this is kind of like um, un, un, unpaid research for me. But it was uh, a little bit more challenging than I'd initially thought when I'd first opened this thing in like 2017, 2018, when I first got the thing. But uh, I definitely want to keep doing continuation talks related to like possible like exploit development related to like CPAP things. So if you're interested, you know, hit me up. So in closing, uh, I hope you like this talk. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out. Like all of my social media and contact info was, uh, you know, a couple a couple minutes earlier. Uh, I implore you to like uh, follow us on social media so that way you can stay up to date with uh, the progress of you know the, the continued you know uh, research that we'll be doing uh, related to CPAP devices and other like projects and services that we're developing and, and refining. And uh, hey, thank you so much for sticking it out to the end. I hope you enjoyed DEF CON. If you're watching this on like social media, like, uh, like YouTube or something like that later, thank you for watching. And uh, honestly, uh, there's a lot of things that we need to improve uh, in society. And uh, I hope you can come you know, reach out and, and kind of like support some of these initiatives that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so yeah, with that, uh, I'll put down a face down and end my turn. Take care.